My name is Isa Agur and I'm the marketing manager of Spine MR uh, from Philips. And today um, we would like to uh, present you this webinar. And just before we start the presentation, uh, maybe it's nice to talk a little bit about uh, UT Southwest where our speakers coming today. Uh, they have seven Philips MR scanners there. They do really routine and research uh, scans. Uh, they have access to different types of patients from back pain to multiple sclerosis, metastasis, infections, and even more. Uh, they perform around 2,500 scans per month in different regions of the spine. And uh, today our speaker, it's really our pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Avna Shabra. Uh, and a little bit about Dr. Shabra, he is the chief of the MSK radiology division at the UT Southwestern. He is the chief of the MSK Imaging at Parkland Health and Hospital Systems and faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Shabra has authored more than 140 peer-reviewed manuscripts and several textbooks, including one dedicated on MR resonance neurography. Uh, Dr. Shabra is a world-renewed expert in MR neurography field, and I would like really to thank him again for this opportunity to present this webinar about this exciting topic. Dr. Chopra, I will uh, give the microphone to you to show us uh, and present uh, to us your experience of today's practice and the future direction of the neurography field. Please uh, go ahead. And don't forget to do the pointer. Thank you, Isa. Uh, thanks to Phillips. Isa, Brian Johnson, who's uh, with us uh, from Philips, as well as the whole crew who works with the uh, work in our setup with our technical development team as well as the clinical team uh, to bring all the new advances uh, in the field of MR neurography, body imaging, and other arenas. Uh, we're really fortunate to have a research agreement with Philips. And uh, very good evening from here, and it's good morning, I think, uh, in Tokyo and Southeast Asia as well as Australia. Uh, so this next hour, we will uh, go over MR spine neurography, and this is a topic which um, is uh, advancing like a very rapid pace, rapid pace, just like uh, what cardiac uh, MR or cardiac angiography did in the last two decades. So whether you are an MSK radiologist or a new radiologist, you will be asked to image nerves, muscles, spine, and this is a very important topic. So better get into it before the others get in. And I'll show you later, there is no competition for this. So basically, once you start doing it, the volumes are going to grow like anything. You may have MSK ultrasound or nerve ultrasound, which may partially answer the questions, but looking for subtle nerve abnormalities, signal changes, and patient may be severely disabled just because of those subtle nerve signal changes. So that neurography is the way to go important modality and as we go forward I'll show you various images of different areas. So I've got images of um, clinical scans and radiologists out there will learn the pearls, how to make these images better, how to use your uh, vendor provided sequence to optimum and um, how to interpret these images. So these are my disclosures. So in this next hour we'll look at technical considerations, anatomic variations, imaging pitfalls, We'll acquire knowledge of imaging signs of neuropathy and flexopathy, how to distinguish those two things. We'll classify the nerve injuries. We'll look at a spectrum of nerve tumors and finally the future directions. So first we always have to understand the anatomical architecture because as we grade the nerve injuries or understand the pathophysiology, we will need to know all these layers of the nerves. And nerve, as you know, is the smallest structure in the neurovascular bundle, so it's kind of hard to image. That's why it's been such a long time before people have started looking at the nerves. They're looking at big tumors or big masses in other organs. But we deal with the nerves in the same way as you do with any other organ. We look for fat in the nerve, hemorrhage, fibrosis, vesicular atrophy, anything happening in the nerve, we want to see inside what's happening. So you need very high resolution images. Uh, and the problem is the veins are bright, the nerves get bright with t 2 weighted images. So how to distinguish that? So we'll go over those techniques. And then this is the basic architecture of the nerve where axon is a building block. And then it's covered by the Schwann cells. And then this purple color is the endoneurium. 
which any of these we cannot see with imaging. But these axons are bundled together in this structure that's called the fascicle, and that's covered by perineurium. Now remember, there's a microscopic fascicle um, and there's a macroscopic. Macroscopic is one that the surgeon is going to see with the microscope or we see with the imaging. A microscopic one is within the fascicle. You may have 50 other fascicles which we don't see. And that doesn't matter because uh, what matters is what's happening um, in the nerve for the surgeon where he can repair it or reconstruct it or do something. So that's why we call this fascicle. And this perineurium as well as this outer yellow epineurium, there's an external and an internal epineurium, they together form the blood nerve barrier. So that barrier basically prevents any contrast getting into the nerve and isolates the nerve from the rest of the bloodstream. Okay, so we'll see in cases like post-surgical inflammatory neuropathy where patients get surgery in one area of the body and the other area of the body gets uh, demyelinating neuropathy. Whether it's the same area or distant from the site of surgery, they get that demyelination. And my hypothesis is that basically you get these antigens released from the nerve, which otherwise are isolated from the bloodstream, and then patient's body gets hypersensitive. So then they go into segmental sensitization and central sensitization, and things like this happen. So this epineurium also supplies um, the vessels and nerve to the nerve itself. So that's the basic architecture. Now we need to understand a little bit about pathophysiology before we go into the techniques, how to image them and how to find the problems. There are a number of insults to the nerves and if you look at neurology literature, there will be thousand causes of different types of neuropathies. But finally, then they, when they find neuropathy with electrophysiology, these clinicians then go back to serology, to the history and to see what's going on and then they can come to a diagnosis of what's the cause of neuropathy, whether it's treatable or not. The same thing on MR you'll see all these nerves as bright in most of the time. And sometimes there'll be different signal characteristics, which I'll show you some examples. But most of the time, the nerve just gets bright. And then you need to know what happened with the patient. So a history is important. Physical exam findings, if you have them, it's important. If any electrophysiology, uh, the results are available, those are also important. But finally, you need to know some patterns and you need to know what normal appearance is, abnormal appearance is. Then you can find how many nerves are abnormal and what's happening. And then you can come to some diagnosis. So at the end of this talk, you should come to a place where you can make a diagnosis rather than just saying the nerve is bright or the muscle is denervated or I can't tell. So we need to go further than that. And then uh, the direct penetrating injury, that's a very predictable injury. They injure the different layers of the nerve. So MR is very good for that. Uh, on neurography, you can see the different layers and you can stage or classify the degree of nerve injury. And within 48 hours, um, uh, within 48 hours, you may start to get some electrophysiology changes, but most of the time you don't detect anything up to seven days, even if the nerve is cut. So there may be a problem in that. But with MR, the time it's cut, you can see it. So it's very quick. The denervation changes, you can see within 24 hours. So it's very fast. So you can make a decision for the surgeon to go in and reconstruct or do whatever, versus waiting for electrophysiology for six months before the muscles get atrophied and then you know it may not be uh, wise to reconstruct the nerve. The third type is a toxic uh, metabolic type neuropathy which is a dying back neuropathy which happens from the motor neurons in the anti-horn cells of the spinal cord and then it goes all the way down to the motor end plate. So basically that whole axon going down to the nodes of the rear, it's, everything is basically dead. So that happens in cases of diabetes, in cases of lead poisoning, any of the toxic conditions can cause that, chemotherapy can cause that. So in any case, all of these neuropathies basically produce three types of responses. So minimal, intermediate or severe or mild, moderate and severe, basically they vary from conduction block all the way to absent response. Okay, But when, even if you have an absent response, electrophysiology is not going to tell you is the nerve cut or is still intact or is just stretched. It's just a matter of time. You have to see the response, what happens over time, and then you make a decision. So this is a, one histology slide I put in. Basically, this is a normal nerve, and it's showing the epineurium outside. The perineurium is this white layer, and the endoneurium surrounds these axons. And then here is a high power view with the endoneurium around the axons. So what happens when a demyelinating condition happens? The nerve gets thick. And what you see is this remyelination and demyelination around the nerve. That's called the onion bulb appearance. Okay, what happens in axonal degeneration, the nerve doesn't get that thick, basically the fascicles atrophy because the axons are gone and what you see on high power is called myelin ovoid, where you have a myelin sheet but nothing inside, all the cells are absent. 
So now the question is, what can we do with imaging? Can we differentiate exonal from demyelinating? That's a tough job. But in our uh, early experience, what we have seen is, or what people have reported with demyelinating conditions, looking at charcot marie tooth disease as the model, if you have a demyelination condition, CMT type 1 or 1A or 1B, in those conditions, it's demyelinating, the nerve gets very thick. If it's exonal, which is CMT2, the nerves don't get that thick. And what we have found in DTI, in the initial study we have done, in demyelinating condition, you still see the fascicles, they're distorted. In the enlarged nerve, there are more fascicles, but they're distorted. Uh, versus in exonal condition, the fascicles are absent. So all those tracks which you see on DTI, they are absent to a significant amount. And But still, you know, those are our prelim preliminary experience, and we'll see in large-scale studies what holds true. Sensory versus motor, that you can detect based on which nerve is involved or it's a mixed nerve, you'll see what nerve is involved. Localization is very good. So with neurography, you can actually localize where the problem is. So giving an example, if somebody has a sciatica, then if you do electrophysiology, the nerve all along the leg would be abnormal. So you can't tell by electrophysiology whether it's something happening in the thigh, something happening in the knee, or it's happening at the piriformis level, or it's happening in the spine, or the preganglionic segment, you can't tell. Okay, only way to tell is, you poke different muscles, and if the gluteal muscles are involved, then you know the injury or the lesion is above the level. It's in plexus somewhere. If the gluteal muscles are not involved, then the injury is somewhere in the thigh. But it's very hard to localize. Versus with neurography, anytime the nerve is abnormal, it will be abnormal right at that site of lesion, injury, whatever happens, disc herniation, and then just above and below that. And if you go distal to that in the thigh or the leg, it will be normal. So it's very good for localization. Okay, then we need to know some patterns of neurologic symptoms. So we have these classic patterns. If you have symmetric proximal and distal weakness with sensory loss and areflexia, basically motor sensory loss, which is symmetric. And if it's acute, we call that William Barr syndrome or AIDP, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. If it's chronic, then we call it CIDP. So usually the GBS is one shot. They get that. It's ascending paralysis. And then uh, they get it for two weeks. It's monophasic illness and they're done. Uh, after that, they recover or they don't recover. While well, CIDP is stepwise degradation, so multiple episodes and they just go downhill. Then there is a symmetric length dependent distal weakness with sensory loss. So this is again a motor sensory problem. It's a length dependent, meaning the thighs are more involved than the legs in terms of weakness, or the arm is more involved than the forearm. And these are the classic toxic ones, or the diabetes, and then charcot marie tooth disease. If you have multiple mononeuropathies, like radial hair, medium hair, ulnar hair, then in the legs, we think about vasculitis. In the upper arms, we think about HNPP, which is another hereditary condition with liability to pressure palsies. They keep getting entrapments, the cubital tunnel, carpal tunnel, tarsal tunnel, so they get that. If you have asymmetric weakness with intact sens sensory, meaning it's just the weakness, then we think about motor neuron disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or spinal muscular atrophy. We think about MMN, which is multifocal motor neuropathy. Uh, in that, the GM1 ganglicide antibodies are positive. Or we think about polio, or we think about some tumors like perineurioma. I'm going to show you a couple of cases of that. If you just have weakness with pain in dermatoval distribution, that means what's happening is motor plus sensory in a dermatomal or it's in a nerve distribution. Then you think about radiculopathy. It may be coming from the cervical spine or the lumbar spine, depending upon upper limbs and lower limbs. Both are involved, or just the lower limbs are involved. And if you get just sensory changes, with or without weakness, but the sensory uh, problem is the predominant, then you think about sensory neuropathies, which happens with perineoplastic syndrome or Sjogren syndrome. If you have significant autonomic involvement, then we think about amyloid or diabetic neuropathy. Again. So some patterns you got to know before you start studying or evaluating these, these patients. Now, the conventional imaging, why not conventional imaging? Well, it's limited because the field of view is small, the slices are thick, the matrix is low, purely 2D imaging, there's a vascular signal contamination, there's no DWI or DTI, so you can get nerve selective images. So you get images like this. So here is a case where a patient had a clavicular uh, fracture fixation. You can see these artifacts from that. And then he had brachial plexus palsy. So patient, the surgeon wants to know, is there a hematoma compressing? Is there a nerve injury? Is there a stretch injury? Or what's going on? We don't know. Is it PSIN, post-surgical inflammatory neuropathy? What's going on? So we repeated the scan. And then here you can see now the problem. 
You can see all these nerves are thick and bright. They don't taper. And once the nerves are thick and bright, they don't go back to normal. They will have always residual disability. And many months will take before it recovers. And here you can see all the way. So sagittal stir is kind of important. This, these images are reconstructed for this scan. From this scan, but you can do the sagittal stir images. And here, all these nerves, you can see, these are C5 to T1, they are abnormal. These are the three trunks, upper, middle, lower, they are abnormal. All the three, um, uh, all the multiple divisions, sorry, these are the, these are the cords, they are abnormal, lateral, posterior, medial cords, they are all abnormal. All the peripheral nerves are abnormal. So this is a stretch injury, uh, which probably happened during this level of fixation. So you can see these pretty nicely, uh, with these 3D images. So there are major problems with conventional imaging. There is no insight into internal architecture. They are often misdiagnosis. You can corroborate the diagnosis of neuropathy by presence of muscle denervation. Uh, there is no differential or real diagnosis which clinicians are looking for. Because patient knows they have a foot drop. Clinician knows they have a foot drop. But why is it? What is causing it? That somebody needs to answer. So what is MR neurography? It's akin to MR in geography. It's a technique that enhances selective multiplanar visualization of the peripheral nerve and pathology by encompassing a combination of 2D, 3D, and diffusion images. So we have all of these elements, and we'll go over these. Basically, we have very high resolution and high contrast. So if you're doing a 2D imaging, your in-plane resolution should be 0.4 to 0.5 millimeters, or you can get it down to 0.3 even better. So what matrix you're looking at is at least 256 or higher. You have 2D and 3D imaging, and 3D imaging, by virtue of another phase encoding gradient, it suppresses all the arterial flow. So you may have some venous flow left over, but it basically enhances that endoneal fluid signal, so the nerves are bright, and then it also suppresses the vascular signal. Then there is uniform fact suppression, so you can compare side to side, just like you do with EMG. You compare one median nerve to the other nerve and see if it's slowing. Um, and most of the plexus nerves, they are very symmetrical in size and signal intensity. So you can compare them. Artifactual nerve signal intensity suppression. So you want to use less and less of stir imaging, but more and more of spare imaging or Dixon imaging. So they suppress artifactual nerve hyperintensity. And you want to gray out the images when you evaluate these. Otherwise, you have artifactual increased signal. Pulsation artifact suppression. You want to suppress that, otherwise it overlaps the nerves. And then you get these blurry artifacts. The nerves in the artifactory look bright. Nerve selective images. So these are important for the surgeons. You guys as radiologists are consultants. And surgeons are coming to you and they want to see where the nerve is abnormal in terms of the bony landmarks. So you want to show them nerve selective images in longitudinal planes and show them where the abnormality is. It may not be uh, sometimes important for diagnosis. Uh, nerves which are traveling at an angle, it might be important. But many times it may not be important, but it's important to show the abnormality. Just like MR in geography. And then nerve quantification. So you can't just say the nerve is bright. You, can, you have to have some quantification measures also. You have FA, ADC, all of that in DTI, as well, we'll discuss later. OK, so what are our sequences? Uh, so this came up this morning also. Like we have all these sequences. Which one we use? Well, this you're going to do in any case, the two-dimensional imaging, axial T1, and whether it's axial T2 spare or Dixon, which is M Dixon on Phillips, um, or stir imaging. So stir, I would say, avoid at all costs, unless you're a very low field scanner. Um, because stir imaging, if you're going to do, the nerve will be artifactually bright in a lot of cases. Very sensitive sequence. You may have pulsation artifacts on that. So you want to keep the echo spacing tight. In that case, it's a very long sequence. You want to do T2 spare in extremities, and you want to do um, T2 Dixon or M Dixon uh, in extremities, but if you're doing the plexuses, then you may want to avoid T2 and Dixon at this point. Now, Philip has a new multi vein um, where there are less, less artifacts anteriorly, but if you're using the older scanners, then in that case, uh, older technology, you'll have artifacts anteriorly. You may not be able to see the nerves that well. For the 3D imaging, we do that in the coronal plane because you get um, those slices quickly and you can finish within seven minutes. And we have a T2 TSC, which is basically the 3D, um, uh, 3D spine, which was shown in the initial slide. Uh, and that can be reconstructed in any plane. And here you want to, the parameters generally are a TR of about 1500 and echo time of about 102, 104. And that gives a nice fluid contrast. It's a non-pat suppressed. 
and this T2 TSC is in a sagittal plane, it's limited to the spine. So we, here we are focusing on the spine to keep that confounder out of plexus anyway. And the voxel size you want to keep for that is 0 0.9 millimeters. Okay. And then BFFE or CIS imaging or Fiesta, these are basically steady state images. We add them, these are GRE based. So you can go to a higher resolution. You can go to 0 0.65 millimeter voxel size. We add them in cases when you're looking at any arachnoiditis, any of the meningeal metastasis, any of the finer stuff, nerve root, rootlet avulsions, not even nerve root. The rootlet avulsions, when you're looking within the fecal sac, these are the images you want to acquire. So that's an additional sequence you will add it. But you will always obtain the sagittal sequence in the plexus with T2 TSC, which is Vista in Philips, uh, space in uh, Siemens, and cube in GE. Um, so th those are the sequences. Now, when you go to the fat suppressed imaging, you want to do the coronal images. So you want to acquire one of these three, depending upon what you got. So coronal 3D stir which Philips has redesigned, it's called stir composite. It's a really good sequence. When I saw this first time, I thought all these nerves are abnormal. They, they, you can see the nerves so white and so nicely. Um, so we are using that routinely now in our brachial plexus. And I'll show you what's abnormal, what's normal, but 3D stir composite is really good. The 3D spare we use in extremities instead of that because it has a higher SNR. 3D shinka we use in the lumbar plexus. But these three are products. And um, among these, the best um, vascular signal suppression and the best fat suppression we actually get from 3D Shinkai. The reason being that it has MSDE pulse which suppresses the vascular signal and then it has spare uh, fat sac which is not as strong as stir but it has got some frequency selective component also and it is higher SNR. So it works pretty good in lumbar plexus because the nerves are in the center of the body and the fat is more anti and posterior so you can see all these nerves. While stir is more important for brachial plexus, where Shinkai sometimes fails. So I use this one for the lumbar plexus, this one for the brachial plexus, this one for the extremity. 3D Vibe or M. Dixon or any other 3D GRE sequence, uh, you would use that for if you're giving contrast, which in most cases we don't give contrast. We only give in cases when there's a tumor or infection in the area. 3D DWI, which is the Pacif sequence, and that's a very useful sequence. I think this is probably the gold standard for neurography. Because all these nerves are gray on the sip. And as they get abnormal, they become white. Okay, and you see them on the PASIF. And PASIF also shows other pathologies as white because it's heavily, it's a combination of T1 and T2 weighted, but it has more T2 weighted contrast. So any problem, say if you're imaging the knee and you, you can find the meniscal tears, you can see the cruciate ligament tears. If you're imaging the spine, you can see the disc herniation. So basically, this is a very good sequence. And I use it all the time in extremities as well as in occipital areas for the migraine, in the face for the inferior alveolar lingual nerves, uh, for the orbital pain, like the intraorbital nerve. So all these nerves you can see pretty nicely. And now we are finding out, you can actually see in the neck, all the lower cranial nerves, 9, 10, 11, 12, which nobody has shown. You can see all these nerves in the neck. So it's a pretty good sequence for that. DTI we use more for the functional imaging. And DTI will give you tracks. And let me give you some parameters to play with. So. The T1 and T2 spare or T2 Dixon, you want to match them up. And your slice thickness will be anywhere from 3 to 4 millimeters. The matrix will be more than 256. For the T2 TSC, you will have 1500 TR, 102 TE, and the voxel size is 0 0.9 millimeters. For the BFFE or CIS or Fiesta, is going to be 0 0.65 millimeters. For the STIR, spare or Shinkai, you want to keep the TR around 2000. The TE anywhere between 65 to 75, so around 75 or so. That's the acquired effective TE. Okay. And then, um, by Dixon, same way. And then for the Pacific, you want to keep the TR, uh, for stir and, sp stir and spare and Shinka, you want to keep the voxel size 1.4 to 1.5 millimeter. Don't go below that because you'll get poor SNR. So 1.4 to 1.5 millimeter isotropic. For the PASIF, the TR is about 12, the TE is about 3 milliseconds. And you use water selective fat side is a 3D coronal, and the voxel size is again 0 0.9 millimeters. So I have played with different voxels and all. I think this is the best one which works for PASIF. For DTI, you want to keep at least 3 B values. So usually when you're doing extremities, you want to keep 0, 800,000. So the second B value is closer to 1,000. And I'll show you why it's 1,000 uh, later. But in the plexuses, you want to keep about 600 or so because you don't have enough 
uh, SNR for those small nerves around the plexuses. And so that's the function of the brain. And you want to keep the DTI TE as low as possible. So on some magnets, you may be able to get down to 65. On some magnets, like uh, the latest magnets, you may be able to get to 60 milliseconds. But lower you go, better it is because the nerve um, uh, T2 time is about 35 or so. So you want to get closer to that. So that's one. And then number two, uh, you want to keep the echo spacing very tight. Okay. So there are three problems with DTI. One is SNR. So to keep the SNR high, you want to keep the echo time low because as you know, the T2 transverse magnetization falls over time, right? So you want to keep the echo time low, then you have higher signal. So one is a signal to noise ratio problem and nerves are small. The second problem is um, the poor fat suppression. So what we do, deal with that is like Philips has these dwibs where they have inversion recovery fat suppression. So same thing we have done with DTI. We have put spare fat sat rather than frequency selective. So that makes it better fat size. So that reduces the ghosting. Um, the third problem is the the uh, the ghosting again. So that ghosting can also reduce by reducing the echo spacing. So keep the echo spacing below 0.7 milliseconds. Okay. So if you do these things, your DTI will be good. Okay. So there is a question here. I do not understand why there are not parameters on the sequences in the images. Okay, so some are proprietary and um, some things we take it off so there's no patient information and all. But basically those are the key parameters what I talked about. So um, I can answer by the time this is loading up. So basically the parameters are pretty standard and I've worked with them over the last eight years. And if you look at any of my articles, they're similar parameters. Um, so the ones I described basically keep the voxel size for any of these 3Ds in the specified um, range what I said. So for the T2 sagittal images for the spine, you want to keep the voxel size 0.9. For the coronal 3D images, the Shinkai and the Stir composite, you want to keep 1.4 to 1.5 millimeters. Okay. For the 2D images, keep the echo time around 60 milliseconds. Don't go much above or much below. Much above, you lose SNR, and much below, um, you won't have the enough um, nerve contrast which you're looking for. Okay. So the TR for the 2D is about 4,000 milliseconds. The TE is about 60 milliseconds. The slice thickness is 3 to 4 millimeters. And the matrix should be more than 256. For the 3D images, 3D star or Shinkai, you want to keep the TR of about anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000. The TE of about 75 milliseconds. And then uh, the voxel size of about 1.4 to 1.5. For the PASIF, you want to keep the TR of about 12, the TE above of about 3, and then the voxel size is 0 0.9. And you want to put the B value, the diffusion value will be about 50 to 60 million, uh, 50 to 60 B value. Okay. And for DTI, try to keep the TE echo time as low as possible. Keep the echo spacing very tight, below 0.7 milliseconds. And keep three B values. The number of directions, we did a study where, and this was done by my collaborator Gustav from Zurich. When you go above 20 directions, you don't gain much. So as long as you keep medium number of directions, anywhere from 12 to 20, you are fine. Okay. So these are the parameters, and they are not many sequences. They're basically five sequences. So for extremity, you're doing axial T1, axial T2 spare, or Dixon. So those are two sequences. You're going to do coronal spare uh, vista which will be this one. Um, and then those are three. And then the fourth one will be uh, coronal passive. And then the fifth one will be DTR. Okay. So for plexuses, we are again are going to do for the lumbar plexus, axial T1, axial T2 spare. We'll do a T2 of the sagittal spine, this one. We'll do a Shinkai coronal. So that makes it four. The fifth sequence there is DTI. And then the additional sequence is this one. If you're suspecting a retinoiditis, you're suspecting meningeal metastasis. So five to six sequences. If you're doing a brachial plexus, then you do axial T1. You open the field of view so you can see all the muscles in the chest and in the neck. And then you're going to do sagittal stir. Okay. So brachial plexus, you have to do stir because the fat side is very hard to achieve otherwise. So you will do sagittal stir and you can see the individual segments. And then you will do a sagittal T2 spine. We'll do a coronal stir composite. You can add this one, the sixth sequence if needed. 
and then again we go back to DTR, which is the fifth sequence. And then contrast you're going to do in case you're suspecting tumor or something. So everywhere there are about five sequences. In the plexuses there are six sequences. Okay. So I think that should answer that question. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, why we, we don't do PASIF in plexuses? This is the reason. Anytime you go in a larger field of view, you're going to get these artifacts. So you want to limit your field of view to 10 to 15 centimeters. Okay. And then in the center, you can see these nerves. And PASIF will show the nerves as gray. It won't show them bright. These are the dorsal nerve of ganglion, which is bright. Okay. So that's about the sequences. And this is a comparison which shows in the brachial plexus a 3D shinkai versus 3D stir. So here you can see that although you can see the nerves, this side you lose the nerves and you get poor fat sat. So that's what happens with shinkai if you use it in the brachial plexus. Okay, so here now you can see this small meningeal metastasis. You see this tiny one? Otherwise, it will be very hard to pick up that stuff. So you have to have no pulsation artifact and then you can see these tiny, the tiny lesions like this. So this sequence is not for bone marrow. You can see the bone marrow you cannot evaluate. This is not outside the thecal sac. This is just inside the thecal sac. And you add it when there is a question of arachnoiditis, like in this case. So now you can see these fibrous bands. You can see these fibrous bands. If you invert the contrast, then you can see all of this white, the grayish stuff, that's fibrous band. The more white is the nerve. So you can pick up these small, small areas of fibrosis. So this patient had about four or five MRIs before and nobody diagnosed it. And when we do, did this sequence, now you can see all these fibrous bands. So you are used to looking at big thecal mass, the central mass or the empty thecal sign. But these are the subtle signs of arachnoiditis. With a little bit of clumping of nerves, then you can see all these fibrous bands. So this sequence allows you to see that. Now, this is the 3D star composite and on this you can see the normal nerves are here on this side which are gradually fading. Now here is a C5 nerve and this is high grade injury here and then this is the remaining nerve and then it's completely ruptured here. And all of the nerves are also ruptured which are sitting here. So this is a scenario you will see with motor vehicle accidents like all these dirt bike injuries. You'll see these kind of injuries. And uh, the surgeons get excited when you see this kind of nerve coming down because they could connect this nerve to intercostal or phrenic nerves and give the shoulder function back. But I told them there is an additional high grade injury here so this probably is not going to function. And that's what they found in interop electrophysiology that this nerve was dysfunctional and they could not connect it. Now if you do uh, imaging of the thecal sac with that um, BFFE or Fiesta or CIS3D then you will see this kind of appearance. So these are the normal the rootlets on the left side, but when you go on the right side, there is nothing. All you see is this fibrous band, this little residual nerve rootlet, and this residual nerve rootlet. Okay, so this is all gone. So it's pretty useful for intrathecal problems. Okay, so what do we have? We have for the brachial plexus, we have the sagittal 3D imaging, which is reconstructed into these two other planes. So that's about six minutes. You got axial T1, that's about 4 minutes, that makes it 10 minutes. Then you have a coronal 3D cell composite, about 7 to 8 minutes, right? So that makes it 18. Then you got a sagittal stir image, which will take another 4 minutes. We do on both sides, so that will be 8 minutes, that makes it 26. And then you have DTI for another 6 or 7 minutes, so that makes it about 35 minutes, okay? If your tech is slow and they're learning and they're positioning and all that, we have an hour to do the scan because we have two codes here. We have a code for the C-spine and we have a code for the chest. So in plexuses, you build for two codes, while in extremities, you build for one code. Whether it's a carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel or whatever. So here is a lumbar plexus. So again, you have a sagittal spine, which is reconstructed into three planes. Um, then you got the coronal 3D stir or shinkai. And then you have axial T1, axial T2. And then this is the MIP image from that. And then DTI, which I'm not showing you here. So again, it's about 35 to 40 minutes. And then you can add the BFFP or cyst 3D um, for additional five or six minutes if need be. Okay, so once we have these images, then one image tells you the whole story. Okay, so here are the normal nerves, the femoral nerves, the obturator nerve, the sciatic nerves. And if you go here, these are all the tumors. And you can go individual nerves and can see like this is the L3 nerve, right? 
So here you can see all these tiny, tiny tumors all the way. So this is a case of schwannomatosis, the cystic changes in the tumors and numerous tumors everywhere. Or in this case, this is a brachial plexus, normal, and this is abnormal. You have all these tumors, and this is a classic neurofibromatosis, many of them showing the target signs. These are the normal intercostal nerves, and these are abnormal intercostal nerves, abnormal brachial plexus. So there's all this thickening of the nerves. This is charcot marie tooth disease on both sides. Here are the normal nerves on 3D PASIF. I'm just showing you in case you decide to do a PASIF, uh, you get artifacts on the side. But this, these are the normal nerves where you have the preganglionic segment, a dorsal nerve of ganglion, a postganglionic segment, right? But in this case, these are abnormal. So how do we know they are abnormal? Well, first of all, they're bright all the way. So PASIF, it should not be bright. So this is a stretched nerve. And the nerve which comes at an angle, that's always L5. So this is L5. The nerve which comes straight down will be S1. This is L4 DRG, which is evolved from here. This is L3 DRG, which is evolved from there. This is the L2 DRG right here, which is evolved from here. So basically, you see all these evolutions. So that's a Sunderland class 5 injury. So we'll go through the injuries later. But basically, you can see that. Now, why not only 2D imaging? If you have high-res imaging, if you have good fat saturation, so these are spare images with nice fat suppression, nice signal-to-noise ratio, no pulsation artifacts. Well, it's hard to pick up these abnormalities. So here is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is abnormal. You can see that bright. And the other side, you don't even see, which is hiding here. You might be better seeing it on the T1 images or nothing. And there's a small neuroma here, which otherwise you will miss it. So that's on 2D imaging. And if you go on the 3D imaging, now you can see the nerves pretty nicely. You can see the whole femoral nerve. You can see the abnormal lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which should become dark over after the inguinal ligament. It still becomes bright, and that's that neuroma. On the other side, you can see this normal nerve. So it gets very easy to see on the 3D images, all of this stuff. So here's a case which came from outside where uh, the question was femoral neuropathy. And I saw something there and I said, oh, I don't know. It's an injury or a mass or what's going on. So I asked them to repeat the imaging. And here you can see this is an enlarged femoral nerve, very hard to see. While if you look at the 3D image, you can see the fusiform enlargement. How is it different from the other side? The other side is this. And after the inguinal ligament, you stop seeing it. Here, you continue to see that. So that's another sign you use for femoral neuropathy. You see the abnormality throughout its extent. And it never fades. It just gets bright and thick. So this was idiopathic mononeuropathy. This we gave contrast, did not enhance. So the surgeon decided to do tendon transfers for this. The other thing which addition you could do, this is a three minute sequence. This is MDIX and quant available on Philips. So on this one, you can actually quantify the degree of atrophy as well as you can quantify the degree of fat percentage in the muscle. So here it's about 3% or so, is 30%. So you can quantify the fat percentage, exactly how much fat is there. So that has been validated against spectroscopy. And uh, this also gives you, because it's a Dixon imaging, it's M. Dixon, uh, it gives you multiple maps. It will give you a fat map, it will give you a water map, it will give you a map where the when the fat is suppressed. Okay, this is a 3D spare TSC, and this is for extremities, and we also use the PASIF. Um, we use both of them, so on spare, you're not going to get the vascular suppression, on PASIF, you'll get vascular suppression. So you have a complementary imaging with vessel non-suppressed and suppressed. So if one gets messed up, you have the other option to look at the nerves. The other option is you can give contrast and get imaging. And with contrast, you're going to suppress the arteries and veins. So these are this is a case done for thoracic outlet syndrome. And in this case, we didn't see any kinking of nerves. So this is done with the arms up. This is done with the arms down. Patient also had underlying CIDP. So you can see this patchy thickening hyperintensity of the nerve right here. But you suppress all the veins and arteries because we get contrast for this case. Uh, this has also been reported in recent journal by Wang et al. And uh, this concept is useful if you don't have any other option. But then you have to give contrast to the patient. And by the way, those were 3D star images after contrast. Okay, the PASIF shows the nerves dark. So this is the sciatic nerve, the tibial nerve, the peroneal nerve, the tibial nerve at the back of the knee, and then this is the medial pseudal cutaneous nerve. So you can see all these nerves pretty nicely um, uh, with PASIF imaging, and they are gray. And 
if you do small field of view, you can magnify them. And when you magnify them, you can see these tiny nerves. So here is the inferior alveolar nerve going into the jaw. This is the lingual nerve going into the tongue. This is the lingual nerve on the left, which is thick and bright. And here, I don't know, it's discontinuous. So I wasn't sure. So I gave it class 4 slash 5 injury. And that's what surgeon ended up calling. He sent me these pictures of class 4 slash 5 injury. So our resolution for these tiny things is as good as theirs. Um, and this is the inferior alveolar nerve, which is also thick. And that also they found there was scarring around it. So this is from prior molar tooth extraction. Here is the occipital nerve. So this is the normal one on this side. This patient had migraines on the left side. And you can see the left nerve is abnormal. It's bright and thick. It gets compressed under the, um, the semispinalis capitis muscle. And basically the surgeon go in and cut that muscle and release the nerve. So new theories are coming out in migraine. They're, they're cutting these nerves. And vasospasm is one theory. But this is another theory, neurogenic theory. So plastic surgeons are going after these nerves. Okay, so here is what you will see in extremities in case of entrapment. So this is another nerve which is enlarged, hyper intense, prominent fascicles, edematous. If you do the passive imaging in extremities, it works very well. This is a vad of fibrous scar tissue. And here is a thick nerve, fusiform enlargement, prominent fascicles. And if you look here, this nerve gets bright here too. So you can see the retrograde valerian degeneration. Basically, you will see this uh, long segments of abnormality. So wherever the nerve is bright, that's abnormal on the Okay, rest of the nerve, you don't see up and down. So that's a normal nerve. So at the site of entrapment, the nerve gets enlarged, it gets bright, and gradually fades to normal. Now, this is anatomic images. I'll show you DTI after that in the same case. The other way of getting nerve selective images are GWI images. So on those images, you can see the nerves, you can see the lesions, but I don't use it because... This is superimposition, right? I don't know if this tumor is coming from this nerve or that nerve or that nerve. I have no idea, right? So I use anatomic images for localization. But I use DTI for functional imaging. And as we go through DTI, now you can see this was a work done by Gustav et al., which was published in AJR. They found that when you go to the B value of about 1,000, you see the most number of tracks in peripheral nerve. Okay? So that's why we use about 1,000 uh, for the DTI of extremities. And now... This is the same case we saw before. This is on diffusion or the DTI image. This is a trace image from DTI. And you can see that the nerve when it's abnormal gets more bright. And you can compare that with the normal median nerve here. And then you can draw the tracks. So here are the missing tracks. So this is what you will see with axonal degeneration, where the tracks are missing. This is the median nerve with the AIN branch. That's the radial nerve. So you can see those tracks. But here the nerve is thick. But the tracks are missing. That's what you will see with axonal degeneration. These patients have claw hand or muscle weakness and things like that. While this case, um, uh, where there's sharpwood Mary tooth disease, you have a hard time finding the DRG because the whole nerve is bright, right? On both sides. These nerves are like horse tails, very thick nerves. So this is a CMT type 1A, which is demarinating condition. And this one coming from the top is a genitofemoral nerve. So you can see all these nerves here. But basically, when you look at retrography, these are all distorted tracks. But they are all there. Okay, so this is what you will see with demolition. Thick and irregular tracks. Now, why DTI? Well, we can see the internal architecture. We can also compute ADC values and FA values of the dysfunctional nerve. So here is a tumor which is in the gluteal area with tiny tails to it. And that tumor was malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor. One of the smallest ones I've seen. From all characteristics, it's less than 5 cm, it's homogeneous, it has tail, it has fat around it, looks like a benign tumor. But this one malignant. And I've seen three of these in the last three years, very similar to these. So these come, but we are pretty much correct because our pretest probability is high that they're going to be all benign, 95% of them, or 99% of them if there is no syndrome. Um, so we are correct that way, but here is one. And we don't know it's benign or malignant. It has a satellite nodule. It has an eccentric target. We don't know. So this turned out to be benign. So how do we distinguish? Well, the DTI helps. You can look at the ADC values. And the ADC values for the benign tumor are all very high. They are 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 2.9. They're pretty high. If you look at a malignant tumor, that's usually below 1.1. Okay, they are 1, 1 1.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. So that's how it tells you the cellularity in the lesion. Now here we have three lesions in a neurofibromatosis. Which one is malignant? Most likely this, right? There is necrotic, it's large. Um, so we thought, yeah, this is malignant. But where to biopsy? The biopsy side is best told by the ADC map. 
So here is the ADC, which is the lowest. That's what we biopsy this whole malignant. And this is what the PET imaging shows. So here you can see the ADC, which is low, and the same area there was a PET uptake. And that's what we ended up biopsy. So I think MR will slowly replace this stuff because PET is known, so non-specific. Like initially they were saying ADC values of 2.5, then they said 3, then they said 4. Now they're saying, look at the delayed imaging. So it's so non-specific. It's better to do uh, MR where you have localization as well as lower ADC values where you can target it. Here is another tumor. And these are again the dorsal um, ganglions. You can see at all levels. Now here, but I'm more anterior, right? Here is more posterior. Now it's because of curvature is more anterior. So at this point, we look for sympathetic ganglion. So now our suspicion is that this is probably a paraganglinoma rather than uh, other peripheral nerve sheet tumors. And that's what DTI confirms. All these tracks are going around the tumor. Nothing goes through it. Okay, here's another one. So this is in the S1 nerve, the nerve coming straight down, right? That's S1 nerve. And in this, um, there is this lesion and nobody will biopsy it. It's a young child. You know, they will give him bladder dysfunction, sexual dysfunction when they grow up. So it's better to do more imaging on this. And here is the DTI. So first thing you notice is that the ADC value is 1.4. And we took the darkest area where the ADC value will be low. If you go to the whiter area, it will be 2.2. So we went to the darkest, which where there is no hemorrhage. We found 1.4. And then you look at the tracks. The tracks are all uniform. They're all present. The size of the tumor corresponds to the number of tracks. So this is a benign tumor. And that's what we call this as presumed perimerioma. And they just followed it for three years. Nothing happened. So now we have seen the techniques, how we can image. So um, when we look at the nerves, we look at whether there is mono or polyneuropathy. And if you're looking at a lesion, is it focal or diffuse? And based on that, you have your differential. OK, so we'll see some examples. But before we get there, we need to know that we are looking at all of this stuff. We are looking at the size of the nerve, the signal of the nerve, the fascicular appearance, the course, the continuity, the enhancement, the perineal fat. We're looking inside the nerve where there is atrophy, where there is loss of fascicular pattern, where there is fat in the nerve, where there is fibrosis or hemorrhage or whatever it is. So we look really in detail. If you want to get more knowledge about it, as Eliza mentioned, I have a book on MR neurography. You can read it. It's a pretty readable small book and it's got everything in there. So here is the DTI evaluation. Again, qualitative evaluation, same for size, signal, course, tracks. Uh, tracks is the additional one with DTI. And then quantitative analysis. What is the FA value of the nerve? What's the ADC value of the tumor? So based on that, you can make a diagnosis. OK, before we go into abnormalities, we have to look at variation. So nerve show variation. They can be bifid. They can be trifid. They can be intramuscular course. So a surgeon will tell you there is hardly any instance when they open a brachial plexus and there is no variation. So variations are very common. Okay, So when the surgeon comes back and tells you, oh, I found a variation, that's probably what's causing your pain. Well, 30% of the population has variations around the sciatic nerve, around the femoral nerve. So you've got to be looking at correlate with the history and got to be looking at signal and size change of the nerve as well. So here is the sciatic nerve, which is split by piriformis muscle on the other side too. This is the peroneal, that's the tibial component. And then here is the femoral nerve, which is split. So you can have variations like that. Here is the intramuscular course of the C5 nerve, which is separated out from the other nerve. So this is a sagittal stud image, which is essential for brachial plexus. And then here you can see the C5 nerve, which is the smallest, is moving separately because there is the intramuscular course. The other ones are straight down. So here also, like we saw in um, L5, the C8 nerve comes at an angle. And the T1 nerve comes straight down. OK, muscle denervation changes. So similar to a brain infarct versus a tumor, the infarct is limited to the territory of the artery, right? Similarly, a muscle denervation change will happen along the nerve territory. Uh, and then secondly, the muscle denervation is basically a shift of intra and extra compartmental fluid or lymphatic congestion because the muscle is not acting. So we call this edema-like signal. And we don't call this myopathy. Myopathy in neurology literature is basically myositis. Okay, so we say denervation, muscle change. We don't say myopathy. Okay, that has a different connotation. Myopathy. So there is no fascial edema. There is no hemorrhage. Uh, the edema is like signal is quite diffuse. Now let's go through injuries, entrapments, and then finally tumors. So entrapments, you will see this kinking of the nerves. 
okay because they're fibrous bands which are kinking just like bowel kinking you have with the bowel obstruction you'll see that and then proximal to that you will see the nerve enlargement so here is ca t1 they're enlarged that's the prominent uh, c7 transverse process so you will see the nerve enlargement is another one where put the patient was operated for cervical rib, uh, for uh, c spine spondylosis didn't get better here are the cervical ribs on both sides this one has a pseudoarthrosis and then you do neurography so this is a spare image when i did it okay i was trying spare for the higher signal to noise and you can see the fats had completely failed Okay, so that's what happens if you use spare imaging in the brachial plexus. But you can see the pseudoarthrosis. And then on the 3D star image, now you can see the nerve is abnormal. This is the C8 nerve which is displaced by this pseudoarthrosis. Okay, and then this is the surgical picture of that. You can see that bony callus between the C7 and the T1 rib. And then this is the lower trunk which is displaced. That's the middle trunk, that's the upper trunk. This is the phalanx nerve. Okay, so here is a case of radiculopathy. So radiculopathy usually is limited to one or two levels and limited to where the foramina is most stenotic, okay, or where the disc is a problem. So here you can see the foraminal stenosis. Here is a nerve which is abnormal. So in these cases, the DRG will be abnormal and the signal of the nerve will be abnormal and gradually will fade. So I'll show you another example. So here it is. You can see the DRG is bright, then the nerve is bright, and it's enlarged as compared to other side and it continues to get some increased signal and after that it fades so you know the problem is going to be here so that's from radiculopathy so here is radiculopathy in the lumbar spine so you can see i've opened the field of view in the axial t2 spare and you can see here there's a disc you can see that disc here that's the crotch filling this side the crotch is dark between the nerve and the thecal sac it's dark here's the nerve here's the disc which is paracentral disc and here you can see the femoral nerve is bright, bright, thick and goes all the way. This is a normal femoral nerve on the other side. So that's a nice Shinkai image. And here you can see the obturator nerve. That's also abnormal, going into the obturator foramen. So obturator nerve is never bright. This is the obturator nerve on the other side. It never gets any magic angle artifact. If the obturator nerve is bright, there's something going on. Okay. And here's the femoral nerve, which is abnormal. So usually they both get abnormal together. Because femoral nerve comes from L234 posterior divisions, obturator nerve comes from L234 anterior division. So they usually get abnormal together. And here, the another thing I want to point out is this. So look at this fat versus muscle. The muscle is brighter than the fat. That's what you want in plexuses. You don't want fat to be brighter than the muscle. Then you didn't get adequate fat suppression. Piriformis syndrome. So there we are looking for either hypertrophy of the muscle impinging on the nerve or atrophy of the muscle or spasm in the muscle. So because of that, these patients will tell you, I got wallet anesthesia or I can't sit. So, I mean, I see patients also for neurography and other conditions. And most of the patients I see, their main complaint is I cannot sit. So if I name my clinic cannot sit clinic, I'll have thousands of patients. So there are lots of patients, they can stand, they can walk, they can't sit. And what they have is this spasm in the muscle which becomes small. And they have this flattening of the nerve and signal chain in the nerve. So that's what you'll see with piriformis syndrome. And you can see here, you hardly see any sciatic nerve. And here, this you also you see some sciatic nerve. And that signal changes can go back into the L5 and the S1 nerves as the cases get dramatic. So here is one of that dramatic case. You can see the split sciatic nerve. You can see the bright peroneal, less bright tibial, signal going back into the L5 and S1 nerve. So that's classic piriformis syndrome. Now here it's on the DTI map, which is a trace map. I've inverted it so you can see that dark signal. Okay, so dark signal means that the, it's approaching bladder. That means the ADC is going up. It has more diffusion. It has lost some axons. Okay, not good. And then this is on surgery, and here you can see the split sliding nerve. Okay, another sign I want to uh, show you is triple B sign of entrapment. So in that case. The entrapment we saw, the nerve gets bright, thick, then it gradually fades to normal signal. Here the nerve gets bright, thick, then it gets dark, and then it gets bright again. That's a bad sign. That means there's a very tight constriction here. So it's bright, black, bright. That's a bad sign. So you'll see that with severe entrapments, with severe nerve injury, with graft degeneration, if the graft was put in to reconstruct the nerve, so that's a bad sign. Okay? And I'm going to show you that here also, in cases when there was epidendal nerve entrapment. So this is scarring from prior pelvic mesh placement. And you can see the nerve is dark here. And if you see on diffusion, 
above that is bright, be below that is bright, in between it's dark. So that's not good. So that's a severe entrapment of the nerve. And the other side, the nerve is here. Okay. So that's the pedendal nerve entrapment. Now going to the injuries, this is classic neurology classification. This one, next one is the one we use. This is a Sunderland classification and you can read in my book. But basically, neuropraxia is conduction block. Exonotomesis is axons are injured. And as we know our layers, class 3 injury is endoneurium is injured. Class 4 is perineurium is injured. Class 5, epineurium is injured. So 1, 2, 3 are medical management, 4 and 5 are surgical management. And class 6 is say if you got knee dislocation and the peroneal nerve got injured, that's a mixed injury, that's outside in. And that based on the partial circumference which is injured and what grade it is from 1 through 5, that's how we grade that. Okay, so let me show you some examples. So here is a case of classic sacral insufficiency fractures. Very common in old population. And here is the S1 nerve. This is normal on this side. Hard to see on that non-vessel suppressed 3D stir. On here, this is normal, so it's gray. While if you look on the left side, this is bright all the way. And on the SIF, it's bright all the way. So you know this is class 1 or class 2 injury, depending upon if there's muscle change or not. In class 2, you get muscle changes. Class 1, you don't get muscle changes. Okay, here's the next one. So this one is a superior gluteal nerve which is above the level of the piriformis. This is the normal one on this side. Okay. So that patient had a motorcycle injury, he fell down and now there's a stretch injury of that. So that will be class 2 injury because the nerve is enlarged here. Okay. And he had some weakness on that side. So that will be class 2. Here is another one where somebody was falling off a roof and then the person tried to catch that lady who was falling. Good gesture. But then he injured his arm. So here you can see the C5 and C6, they are bright and you can see them on the sagittal images, they are thickened. So this is class 3 injury with motor weakness. Now whether you call it class 2 or class 3, it doesn't matter a whole lot. It's based on the degree of abnormality, but both are medical management. Here is a case where a patient had a vaccination in the gluteal area and she said, oh God, somebody went in my nerve. So here you can see there is a neuroma there. So that will be a class 4 injury. Here is a bigger neuroma. You have a posterior tibial nerve, it ends up into a neuroma. Somebody went with golf cart and jammed in this lady's ankle. And then after that, you can see the thread like nerve coming down. So this is a neuroma in continuity versus the end bulb neuroma that will be class 5. So this is class 4 injury and this is on surgery. So this is a case where a patient had an IV cannula injury. And now what you can see is this median nerve is enlarged. And that median nerve has this thickened epineurium, prominent fascicles. And around the fascicles, you have this dark stuff, which is a thickened perineurium. So you know that there is internal fibrosis in the nerve. So somebody stuck the nerve when they were doing the IV cannula injury. And this is on 3D imaging. You can see bright, black, bright, black, bright, black, bright. So that tells you there are all these areas of entrapment wherever they try to injure that. Okay, They didn't try to injure it, but it accidentally happened. So these patients don't go back to normal, by the way. So here is a case of failed back. So that's another problem, post-op complication. And often you will see some scarring around the nerve or some enhancement if you do just fine imaging. But when you do neurography, what are you going to see? Well, this is the enlarged dorsal nerve ganglion right where the tract is. This is on diffusion. This is a prominent L5 nerve. That's on diffusion. And then when you look at 3D, you can see this is a normal L5 nerve tapering. That's the S1, which is a straight nerve. This is the S1 on this side, the S2. The L5 is enlarged preganglionic, irregular DRG, thickened nerve, bright, all the way down, going into the sciatic plexus. Okay? So that's a problem. So we have seen many of these, and we just put out a paper. Uh, it's under review right now. We saw about 25 of such cases within a year. Okay? So it's not uncommon. It's just that people are not looking at it. Okay, so what's the diagnostic algorithm for patients with injuries? Well, when you see multiple nerves, it's usually a systemic process, diabetes or something. If you're looking at single nerve or in the area of trauma, if the muscles are normal, that's a class 1 injury or grade 1 injury. That goes to medical management. So going further, it's class 2 or class 3. Those basically both have medical management. 
And right now we are studying in, with diffusion and other tools and see if we can differentiate class 2 versus 3. And what I found is difficult for surgeons also as class 2 versus 3, although there are pathologic criteria. So we are planning a study where we will look at this particular category. If nerve has a mixed appearance and it's outside an injury, then we call it class 6 injury. And based on what the grade is, if it's 1, 2, 3, it goes to medical management, and 4 or 5 goes to surgical management. That means a partial circumference of the nerve is involved from external injury. Okay, so we saw all these injuries, but you have to be careful if the nerve is enhancing. So here we got a T2 sphere image where the nerve is enlarged. That's a sciatic nerve. This is a normal on the other side. And when we looked at contrast, it's bright and enlarged and thick, right? So this, one of my colleagues called it a neuroma. The surgeon went in and um, they were doing the neurolysis and patient didn't have any injury. Then they said, how come we have a neuroma in a thigh area? So they called frozen section, they called pathology, they sent for path, everything was negative. Then they showed me this case. So I was shown this case seven days post-surgery. Um, this was a pre-op case and I said it should not enhance. If it's enhancing that much, we have to think about lymphoma or something. And the next day the path came out to be lymphoma. So then the surgeons were puzzled. They asked the patient, she said, yeah, 20 years ago she had B-cell lymphoma, which was she was cured. And here now you can see in three months it grew like crazy. And here on the on the 3D image, now you can see this whole leg is involved by that lymphoma. Okay, that's all the sciatic nerve. And you can see that on the PET image as well. So you have to be careful what you call as neuromas. Okay. Now looking at other tumor, this is a classic tumor which you've seen young adults. This is a perineurioma. This is a fusiform tumor which happened in the sciatic distribution. It may happen in the peroneal distribution, which is again sciatic uh, branching, or in the femoral nerve. So usually in the lower legs, you get this kind of lesion. And if you look on the axial images, this looks like honeycomb appearance. So here's a normal tibial nerve. And here's the peroneal nerve, which is all in large fascicles like a honeycomb. So these are perineuriomas. And these tumors uh, cause isolated motor weakness. They have no sensory changes. And leg slowly dies. Even if you do surgery, patients don't do well. That's Mayo Clinic has been reporting. They have the largest series. Okay, other PNST types. Here are schwannomas, which are these small tumors. These are segmental schwannomatosis. There are multiple schwannomas intermingled, so these cannot be resected, while well, this can be peeled off with the eccentric tumor. And this is plexiform neurofibroma. This again can be debulked, but cannot be peeled off. And here we have a chance of malignancy. We don't have chance of malignancy in these, but with neurofibromatosis, there's always a chance. Okay. So this is a case of schwannomatosis with all these cystic tumors again. I showed you in the lumbar area. This is in the chest area. And pet uptake in these doesn't matter. Okay, these are all benign tumors, doesn't matter. While PET uptake in neurofibromatosis matters. So there you want to do ADC, you want to see what's going on. And you're also looking for, in all these nerves studied with tumors, you're looking for this odd tumor. And that odd tumor will be the malignant ones, which has necrosis, which has peritumoral edema, which is heterogeneous, which has low ADC, which has disrupted tracts. So those are all the things you're looking for. The other things we look for are hemorrhage within the nerve. So this is a sciatic nerve. This is a normal one on this side. And this one has hemorrhage. And we also have hemorrhage around it with desmoid-like scarring, desmoplastic reaction. So this is endometriosis, very classic appearance. So these patients will come with cyclical sciatica. The tumors may appear similar. So we have three tumors here, all of them coming from C5, C6. Okay, which one is malignant? Hard to tell. Okay, um, so this was a schwannoma, this was a schwannoma, this was NPNSD or malignant tumor. So how do we tell? Well, we have other tools. So we can look at that, which was a schwannoma. You see partially disrupted tracts and the ADC value was 1.9. Versus this one has completely disorganized tracts and the ADC value is 0.8. So you can tell the cellularity. This one is more fusiform enlargement. Again, the same, you know. C5, C6. In this case, C5 I'm not showing. This is C6 and C7. So they were thickened. Most of the tracks are maintained. They're partially disrupted, but the ADC value is very low, 0.8. So this was lymphoma. Here we have another one, and this is fusiform. 
Most of the tracks are maintained. Some are disrupted on this side. The ADC value was 1.5, so we know it's benign. So this was perineurium. Here you have bilateral abnormalities, uniformly thickened nerves, quite symmetric. So whenever it's a symmetrical process, we think about hereditary cause. In this case, this was charcot Tooth disease. We do the ADC values, they are high, they are 1.9, 2.1. So we know it's just a benign condition. And here is another charcot Tooth disease. If you just look at the coronal images, these look like tumors. This looks like another schwannomatosis. But if you do a MIP imaging, you see these are indentations by the intercostal muscles. Which means that this is just uh, this is a charcot Tooth disease. And you can see the brachial plexus also thick. And you don't see the DRGs anymore because the whole nerve is bright and thick. Here is a case of myeloma where there is another cause of diffuse neuropathy. This patient had symptoms in the front, not so much in the back. And you can see the operator nerve is bright. So that's abnormal, right? Operator nerve should be dark. So this is another Shinkai sequence showing all the femoral nerves are bright. The LFCN is bright. The operator nerves are bright. Here LFCN is not bright. So you know it's not hereditary. It's asymmetric. And when it's asymmetric, in this case, patient had these burnt out myeloma lesions. So this was post chemotherapy neuropathy involving the anterior nerves. The posterior nerves were okay. And here is a case where there is bilateral nerve abnormalities. More on one side, less on other side. So we know that this is acquired cause. And I asked the neurologist, what else you can tell me? They told me that patient had multiple myeloma some time ago. And then I made the diagnosis of amyloid. We asked to biopsy the sural nerve, and here is the sural nerve biopsy, and you can see these amyloid, the green uh, birefringence to look for. And here is another patchy cause where you have patchy thickening of the nerves. So this you see also in the sciatic nerve. So this is CIDP. That's another cause of systemic neuropathy. And in these cases, you want to look at these sclerotic myeloma lesions. Okay, so that's CIDP. If you are seeing the same thing in the upper limb, patchy thickening of the nerves, that will be multifocal motor neuropathy. You have to test for anti-GM1, anti-ganglioside antibodies. In these cases, the, this is a passive image showing the ulnar and the median nerve, they are also bright. So this is multifocal motor neuropathy. Here is post-surgical inflammatory neuropathy, where all the nerves are super bright, they are thick. That happens because of demyelination. The autoimmune phenomena which can happen at the site of surgery or away from the surgery. This patient had a lot of fat taken out from her body for cosmetic purposes and after that she had motor sensory symptoms and you can see all these nerves are bright. So that's a PSIN, post-surgical inflammatory neuropathy. So then we have uh, where we are and where we are going. Well, you will have more widespread use of MRN and you will be asked to do it. There will be more high field imaging because 3D imaging is better on the high field. There will be improvement in the MRN technique, especially DTI in the foreseeable future with Zoomate and other techniques Philips has and other vendors. Uh, Post-op imaging will become more common because again, we have no competition. A short of opening the patient, the only thing which surgeons have is MRI, okay, or imaging to look at the nerve. Whole body MRN, I think, will develop over time. I'll show you a couple of examples from the study we did. Impact studies will come out, how we are changing this whole field, you know, where you have five MRIs, no answer, one neurography gives you the answer. So we we'll look at these, we are looking at impact studies, I have published a few of them and more will be coming. And then we we'll use these as biomarkers, how much is the signal change, how much is the size change, what is the FA value, ADC value, can we predict how the patient is going to do over time. So those studies will come out over time. So this is a paper I would encourage to uh, you guys to read it, it's in neurology. And it talks about that patient were suspected of post-interosis nerve entrapment by supinator at the arcade of Close at the supinator level. And they found that all the way up in the arm, this is in the arm, you can see the fascicular abnormality. So they are not just entrapments, they are far away other problems also. And these fascicular abnormalities dictate which muscles are abnormal. So there is a topography uh, within these fascicles which determine which muscles are abnormal. And based on that, you can find the abnormalities and you can also direct your biopsies. Um, and this is showing the comparison between STIR and SPARE and Dixon. So SPARE, I said, we don't use it anymore in the brachial plexus. But 3D STIR composite works pretty good. And then this is a Dixon sequence, which uh, was developed by the same group for us last year. And uh, that was published in radiology. Basically, that also shows that you can get multiple maps. You can also look at muscles, not just the nerve. 
and the isotropic resolution. So this is 1.4 in all three planes. And this is acquired in about six minutes. So this is my book. If you want to read more about it, it's a, I don't make a whole lot of money from this, so don't worry about me. But this has everything in there. It's quite a cheap book to buy. And I would encourage you to reach out to your Philips vendors or whosoever is your vendor, application specialist, and they can set up your protocol. Okay? And if you use the parameters I talked about, you won't have problems in creating images. Then the problem comes, everybody takes my protocol, they put on them, they create images, then they don't, don't know what to make of that. So then there will be Facebook and not Facebook, the FaceTime, they will be sending me images and little videos of this and that. So it consumes a lot of my time. I say if you read this book, you will know a lot of it, a lot of the stuff which I talked about. Okay, I'm ready to take any questions which you have. So here is a question which says, do you have... Uh, what is it? Uh, what sequences do you suggest for failback? Do you routinely give contrast? Yes. In failback, we do give contrast because we're also looking for collection, abscess, all of that. And the sequences are the same. There's no difference. Only thing I add is the Fiesta to look at intratrical segments. Okay, next we have is this from Dr. Agarwal again. Do you have experience with MRN in case of myopathy? Yes. We have a very big group here in terms of rheumatology and myopathy group and we image for myopathies and basically the nerves are normal in those cases and all you see is muscle changes and I tell you the the MDIX and I've used from Philips some of these muscles uh, I don't know if I have the case here on laptop with me but some of these muscles they look like they are ABMs you see such good perfusion with the activity and we do a lot of scleroderma patients so you can see the skin thickening you can see the subdermal enhancement it's pretty nice with these, uh, you should apply that 3D spare as well as uh, MDIX and contrast. Okay, any other questions? Do you do MRN for all failed backs? No, we don't for all failed backs. So again, um, I usually don't advertise the MRN, believe it or not. Because I knew when I came to UT Southwestern, it's going to follow me. And I don't want all pain patients knocking my door, which they are now. So I don't advertise MRN. And most of these cases go to neuro, they do lumbar spine, or some come to us through orthopedic spine. Um, and then when they see something, the patient is severely symptomatic, they take care of that. If they don't see anything, patient is still symptomatic, then they send for MRN. And I know on MRN, in every case, I'm going to find something. Because either the nerve is abnormal, they injured it, preganglionic segment is abnormal, or the sciatic nerve is abnormal. Or sometimes what, are, what we have seen in our series, some patient may have other problems. They may start to, um, their, their spine is fixed now, then the other thing crops up like hemorrhoids. You know, you take out one hemorrhoid, the other one crops up. So now the piriformis stuff shows up. So then I inject the piriformis and get them better that way. So these are complicated patients. Thank you very much and wish you a very good evening or day, wherever you are. Thanks for your participation. Bye bye. Thank you all. I see a lot of thanks. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you very much. Innovation and you. Philips.